Damn them! Fight for all your worst soldiers! We've got to win this! It was the sudden appearance of a warp storm at the Kaurava system's outer edge that first caught the attention of the Imperium, and not just the Imperium. After hundreds of years under the neglectful watch of the Imperial Guard, nearly every force in the galaxy would descend upon the planet of Kaurava, bent only on domination and victory. Three races had long dwelled in there. The Imperial Guard, its supposed rulers. The Orc tribes of Kaurava II, which the Guard had never successfully put down. And the Necron, who had slept undisturbed for untold millennia beneath Kaurava III. Where the Chaos Marines came from, or how, none can say. Did the Warp Storm bring them, or did they bring the Warp Storm? Both appeared suddenly on Kaurav IV, and in an eye blink, half the system's Imperial forces were gone, killed or claimed by the madness of Chaos. In quick succession, the others brought to Kaurav. The Space Marines, the Imperium's super soldiers, descended on Kaurav II, planning to finally cleanse the system, both of the troublesome orcs and the Chaos Marines, the sworn mortal enemies. The Tau appeared next, not far above, on one of the planet's moons, in the interests of protecting its ordered empire from the effects of human folly. The Tau came seeking to contain the Warp Storm, and in so doing, expand the territory's border. On their moon, they built a mighty fortress, and there forged a space cannon capable of interplanetary devastation. Among the wastes of Kaurava III, the Necrons, perhaps awakened by the disruptive forces of the Warp Storm, slowly massed their lethal legions. In quick response, webway gates, long unused, flickered to life and Eldar poured forth, ready to battle their dark, death-dealing adversaries. Meanwhile, in the shadow of an ancient portal gate, the dark Eldar slipped stealthily out of the murky depths of the webway. They would be like carrion birds, flying above the battlefield, and when all were weary from the fight, make the battlefield into a feasting ground. Last to arrive, and perhaps most to be feared were the Sisters of Battle, holy maidens and bearers of the God Emperor's faith. They had come to cleanse the system of corruption and filth. Their faith left them fanatical, unafraid of death and solace in their cars. Nothing here was clean. All must be purged. Now, War rages anew, and only the victorious may write their history. Only the victorious will claim the planets of Kaurava.
The vast Tau military complex on Karava II's second moon had always been intended for purposes above and beyond the current war. In a Tau-dominated solar system, this complex would become a key outpost on the Empire's border. This moon base had been named Nan Yanoi, or Sword Moon, referring to the powerful Arka Cannon built there. This weapon could fire its devastating iron beam on any territory of any planet in the system. Heavy fortifications and anti-aircraft arrays were not enough for the Earth-cast architects of Nan Yanoi. To these, they added an ambitious orbital perimeter defense system, which would fire ion beams similar to that of the Arka Cannon, tuned to harm only intruders and spare Nan Yanoi's infrastructure from any damage. When complete, Nan Yanoi would be unassailable. Unfortunately, the Tau stronghold was attacked before it was complete. Many systems and fortifications were not yet fully operational, including the perimeter defense system. An invasion fleet could be shot down, but they could not as easily protect against a small force from making a beachhead at one of the gaps in the Tau's outer defenses. Such a feat would be extraordinarily difficult, but it might just be possible. We welcome your gracious presence, Aun Royer. I see that our Earthcast engineers have made splendid progress in constructing the Nanyanoi base station. Yes, Your Eminence, it is nearly complete. There are only a few gaps remaining in our perimeter defenses, and they are heavily guarded until our orbital defense system is fully operational. Setting stabilizers, ready to fire. Excellent! And this Arca cannon you have built, quite a marvel, as I understand it. Indeed. From this moon, we can fire on any habitable territory in the Kaurava system. Do you wish to inspect it yourself? It harms only advanced life forms, thus avoiding damage to structures and plant life. This is indeed most commendable. Our orbital defenses were built using the same technology. Both are controlled from this location. What is that? The perimeter has somehow been breached. I must attend to this. Please, Your Excellence, return to the Coalition Center. Yes, that may be best. Dispatch Pathfinders, locate the source of the breach, and see that they do not gain entrance and establish a foothold. Notify all Fire Warriors and Truth Carnivore squads. Let us hope that our defenses are strong enough to hold them. Listen up here! This is the plan! We move fast, see? We knock through them all, fast till we're inside! Then we build a tab, got it? Good! Orcs is made for fighting! Alright, now listen up, boys! We got this far, that's good! That's cause we the Orcs, and I'm Gorguts, the one and only! No one stops Gorguts, now bring in the Grunts and the Fort! Yeah! <laughs> that's what I like to see! Get them buildings put up, and quick-like, so we can get down to the fighting! Fire. 
Baron Rouge, noble ethereal. Oh, we have lost you. We have lost all. The warlord Gorguts took it as a personal affront that the Tau had chosen a base of operations on the moon directly above the Orc Enclave in the Rock Claw Mountains of Karavatu. More offensive still was the Arca Cannon, which exemplified the Tau principle of fighting from a safe and tactical distance. Of course, almost anything could offend Gorguts and he would have come to attack the Tau sooner or later just because they were there. Had Commander or Eska succeeded in finishing the defenses of his moon base fortress, the orcs might have beaten themselves bloody against its shielded outer walls. Unfortunately, the smallest breach in those walls was like a crack in a dam. Once through, the orcs closed the distance on the ranks of fire warriors and crushed them beneath their massive forms. While much was looted by the orc hordes, Gorguts claimed the Arca Cannon for himself, planning to use the biggest a guns he had ever seen to aid his wall. The Blood Ravens had learned the value of speed and mobility through hard battlefield experience. Force Commander Boreal, who had studied under the famed Commander Angelos, sought to make his reliance on stationary defensive structures as small as possible. Therefore, rather than build up the Space Marine's central command, entire companies were reserved in the fleet above Kaurava II. These would be ready to deep strike with deadly speed into any territory, including the Blood Raven's own headquarters. If attacked by an enemy, drop pods would cover the Marine stronghold in a steely, thunderous hail, swarming the Space Marine's enemies with super soldiers and dreadnoughts. Force Commander Boreal was sure of his plan. His greatest weapon was, after all, the superiority of the Space Marines themselves. Who could weather such a rapid and devastating defensive tactic? Commander Boreal, enemy forces in our perimeter. Where? Southern Quadrant, but they were on the move. Current location unknown. There is no time to be lost. Battle, brothers! Space Marines, today the enemy is at our door. We know our duty and we will do it. We fight for our honor as Blood Ravens, as Space Marines, and we fight in the name of the Emperor! And if we die this day, we die in glory. We die heroes' deaths, but we shall not die. No, it is the enemy who will taste death and defeat. As you know, most of our battle brothers are stationed in space, prepared to deep strike. Our perimeter has been prepared in the event that our enemies should be so bold and so foolish. We have placed numerous beacons, allowing for multiple, simultaneous, and devastating defensive deep strikes. Codex Astartes names this maneuver Steel Rain. 
We will descend upon the foe. We will overwhelm them. We will leave none alive. Meanwhile, our ground forces will ensure the full defense of our headquarters. We are the Space Marines. We are the Emperor's Fury. Deep strike squads, prepare for deployment. Brothers, strike at will. Time for a war from above! Let's stomp some humans! Assault Team Bravo, attack! They shooting us! They call me Stumpy! We have lost one of the Deep Strike Beacons, sir. Yes, we have. Sir, every beacon we lose reduces our ability to strike on the field. Do you think I care if we lose a beacon or two? This is war! War! All we need is enough Battle Brothers on the ground that we can crush them under our boot heels and destroy them with our bolters. That is what matters, Space Marine! We have failed! The Emperor! Warboss Gorguts had fought the Blood Ravens before, and he knew they were good enemies. Blink your eyes and they'd give you a good stomping! This time, though, he figured it was them that had blinked, and him and his boys who would be doing the stomping. Still, when the Wa reached the northern reaches of Kaurava too, those blood ravens put up a right good fight, and tore up plenty of orcs before Gorgots closed in and squashed them good. Those boys that made it took plenty of trophies and skulls, and the mechs got their green paws on plenty of the human's gear. Those orcs that had shown the greatest bravery and skill that day were granted a true honor, promotion to Gorgut's elite personal guard. Little was ever uncovered, and little will ever be known of how the Warp Storm was unleashed on the Karava system's fourth habitable planet. Whether the guardsmen there grew corrupt and turned to evil worship, or whether the storm took them unawares, is an open question. What is without doubt is that at the storm's eye lay the lair of the Chaos Space Marines. And at the heart of this lair, a network of unholy and blood-stained shrines linked somehow inextricably to the storm itself. Although the lethal warp storm would flicker and squall here and there, ever shifting, a permanent conduit to the warp was maintained between these shrines. A charged field of immateria whirled there, certain death to any who had not given themselves over fully to chaos. In that radiant deadly energy field, strange shapes could be seen dancing, screaming, howling. 
Any would-be conqueror of this unholy citadel would somehow have to dispel the chaos field that protected it. To enter it would be certain death, and while it stood, nothing could reach the forces of chaos that lurked at its center. They come! They come! Yes! We feel them! They approach! Their blood shall flow at our feet! Blood for the Blood God! Yes! We shall slake our thirst for death! For chaos! For terror! Yes! They draw near. Let them come. The very ground will poison you. Demons will appear from the warp when your back is turned. And we shall lash out from every direction, and yours shall be the cries of death and horror. <laughs> The sound of your doom will ring in your skull, in your soul. You shall tremble, and your blood shall be a gift to the Blood God! Let them come. We are ready. I have the power of Gorg and more. No! We cannot lose! We cannot die! How can we? Without our devotion? Without our sacrifice? Oh, the horrid blossom of chaos will wither! We'll die! world is slipping from our grasp. When Warboss Gorguts set his sights on Karava IV, he knew that sooner or later he would square off against the Alpha Legion. By and large, the Great Orc did not pay much attention to the subtle differences between the different human armies. But he knew the Chaos Space Marines, under Chaos Lord Feravius Caron, wielded great powers, and so was eager to test the strength of his Orc hordes against such a foe. The greatest challenge for Gorgut's army was the unnerving face that the Legions of Chaos present to their foes. What the Alpha Legion had in horror and the dark powers of Chaos, the Orcs made up for in sheer numbers, size, and strength. When the battle was won, Gorguts allowed the Kalraven boys to loot their skull trophies, weapons, and other prizes, while a giant WA banner was planted where once a Chaos Vortex had been.
The Dark Eldar little feared an attack on their base of operations, situated as it was on the dark side of the moon, well within the reaches of the warp storm of Kaurava IV. The seventh ancient gate lay on that moon, but the Dark Eldar, knowing its technology well, had fixed it to work only for them when they had arrived there. The effect of this hubris and the general anarchic nature of Archon Tarald's soldiers resulted in a sprawling makeshift reproduction of Komora, the Dark Eldar home city. Surrounding the major war camp lay smaller camps, surrounded by miles of torture ground, a sort of cage garden of the homunculus Kumanael's making. Rich with plunder, enslaved scraps and goods, this area had grown and sprawled. Meanwhile, the center grew dense with powerful Dark Eldar and the legendary Asdrubael Vect, leader of Taril's Black Heart Cabal, was said to oversee the war preparations there. To say the Dark Eldar were unprepared for an attack would not be quite accurate. The Dark Eldar are ever ready for battle. It is a sport and a passion to their kind, and there is no such thing as catching them off their guard. Nonetheless, the miles of torture gardens were poorly attended at best and full of prisoners, many still capable of turning against their captors. For an attacker, there was a faint glimmer of hope. We are fresh from the fight. We have shed blood. Death, terror, and anguish sang sweetly in our ears. Ah, but Lord Taril, have you taken prizes? Do you doubt me, Grumenea? Many prisoners were taken. We have our tribute to Komara, and many left over from our slave chambers and your torture grounds. Come, Archon! Come to my torture grounds. We win. Win and lose, but always richer, richer with slaves and spoils. Indeed, we shall be well respected and rewarded when we return to Komara. When we return, if we return. Return the victors, or return the vanquished? My grounds, where screams are flowers and pain. Their fragrance. Hmm, a fine, fine nest we have. High upon the cliff, hard to see, harder still to reach. <laughs> Will they reach this nest? Will they take away my garden? Are you questioning my right to lead? My inevitable victory? I am the deadly shadow and the bird of prey. I am the poisoned dagger that brings swift death. These crude and foolish armies know nothing of strategy. If they see a wall, they attack it. If they see an army, they charge at it. They will be too busy with each other to notice us. Or if they do, it will be too late. Worry not. And it is of no matter, we keep a keen watch. If an army approached, surely we would see it coming. Then, we will tear it to pieces. Ah, what's all we boys in tightest when they ought to be snapping the necks of them pale-faced pointy ears? Come on, smash them cages! Start with that one right there! Orcs is the biggest and the strongest! We's all gonna die! The boss! 
Do we get to show up? You fool! I will have your head for this! Quickly, back to Kamala! Well, if he had died, I should have taken his place. Now I must flee. War boss Gorgut's avalanching war rescued Lacune. There was little that the Dark Eldar could have done to defend themselves or escape with their lives. Thinking their moon base safe from notice or harm, they had squandered any chance of rebuffing the orcs that they could possibly have gained. Taril's humiliating defeat sent him as Drubael Vect and sundry other Dark Eldar fleeing back into the webway to their home city of Komara. Meanwhile, Gorguts and his orc mobs had invented a new sport, which involved putting Dark Eldar into their own cages and seeing how far they could throw them in the moon's reduced gravity. Several knobs attempted to harness and tame the warp beasts they found, but without any luck. Gorguts did not let his orcs linger for long, however. Ultimately, Lacune was one in a line of provinces to be crushed by his unstoppable wall. The Sisters of Battle rely greatly on their faith. It is their sustenance and their shield. When they first came to the tainted world of Kaurava, Confessor Turgenum March was quick to see how much holy light and fire it would take to cleanse the four planets. He therefore brought the living Saint Anias and placed her in their primary bastion in Sama on Karava I. Following a secret and ancient practice, the living saint was imbued with the inviolable aura, an aura of invincibility which would prevent any chance, he thought, of defeat. Guarded at the last by this inviolable aura, the Sisters of Battle marched with great surety. Who, in truth, would dare oppose them? What adversary could faith and fire not sweep from before them? In the face of chaos and vile aliens, the Sisters of Battle merely redoubled their fervent prayers and penances and fought on. They came to believe that glorious victory was the only outcome. The idea that any would dare attack their mighty bastion was unthinkable. The possibility that their bastion could fall beyond belief. Good she comes. Sisters, the living holy saint of the Emperor, Saint Anias, scourge of heretics. Now, in the name of the Emperor! Good. There, it is done. May the Emperor's blessing carry us on to victory, sisters! We thank you, honored martyr. So... It is true, then. These blessed shrines will confer... invincibility? Indeed. Within each 
shrine lies a true and sacred relic of the Ecclesiarchy. Now that the edifices have been blessed by a living saint, they confer upon her the inviolable aura, as scribed and fervently mastered by the great Ecclesiarch, Jonasiah Vuonis. And wherever she goes, no harm may befall us? Precisely. Neither our persons nor our belongings. One pure bright candle amidst a sea of filth and darkness! That is well said, Canoness. This is a tainted system. It may, in fact, be irredeemable. Then we shall purge it with fire. I have yet to find a cinder that was not faithful in its praise of the Emperor. All is made ready? Yes, mistress. Good. These would-be conquerors shall have a taste of our fire and faith. The Emperor will punish them through us. Boss! Hey, step boss. Do we get and shut up? Know that we shall never surrender. Oh, hey, boss! Every Lady. sister to the last would rather die a holy martyr in a field of flame. Then lay down her arms. Uh, uh, Exalted and luminous saint. To that I beg you, fight by we our side. Together past. we will fight. And by the Emperor's will, we will, I will triumph! They won't see us coming. Unworthy they fools, you shall not harm this holy place. What? Smash him up, but good. What do you want? Good horn. There's too many of them. The boss, who is getting shot up? They strike at our convents. Well, we are not yet short of the faithful and ready for battle. The shrines in ruins. My shrines I dare. in ruins. Woe unto us. If that's what you want, we're Not ready! Forsaken. What are you lost. waiting for? And yet we this must fight! Sisters, we must fight and go in glory! We must go in flames! In flames! army smashed the sisters of battle. War boss Gorguts saw such things as he had never guessed could fight under the banner of the Imperium. Although they were no orcs, they had fought heartily enough, and he was not sure that they were any less Bernie than his Berniest boys. He suspected that they even had their own form of war. 
Although anyone knows you can't have a war without proper banners. Gorguts and his elite guard claimed many trophies from the gear of the Sisterhood. Being a type of human soldier they had heard of, but never before encountered. For years to come, the formidable war boss was obsessed by the winged flight of the living saint who had fought him, going so far as to ask his best mech boys to see about making him wings of a similar kind. The Imperial Guard's headquarters in the Dusala precinct of the city planet of Kaurava I was also the system's primary Bane Blade production facility. Under the strong and capable leadership of the new Governor General Vance Stubbs, the Guardsmen were once again well supplied, armed, and organized. Any attacker would find themselves facing a formidable amount of firepower. Since the outbreak of the Warp Storm on Kaurava IV, the Imperial Guard had known a humbling series of setbacks. Losing a full three-quarters of their fighting men was just a start. General Stubbs was determined to triumph in the face of this and all other adversity. Unfortunately, a full regiment of Baneblade tanks, the Guard's armored superweapon, had that very day been dispatched to various territories throughout the Kaurava system. The Dusala Precinct Headquarters was thus left without a single Baneblade to its advantage. But they had their factories. Repair parts, munitions, and operating crews were moved via a system of convoys to the centrally located Mars Pattern Buildings, which produced the tanks. These convoys, then, were to be the Imperial Guard's weakest link, and also their greatest hope. How are the men? Tolerable, sir. Morale? Good at central, poor in the front. Casualties? The same, sir. Firing squads? Twenty today, twelve for cowardice in the line of duty. Baneblade production? Tank crew munitions and parts are arriving by convoy on schedule, sir. As you know, it takes only the most highly trained crew to properly operate a... I know. Very good, General. How many do we have on hand? Unfortunately, sir, a shipment of 100 Baneblades has just gone out to serve. I see. Look at this. Once this was a fine city, gleaming beacon of the Emperor's light, a center of industry. Now look at it. Commissar, I would like to see this city built up again. I would like to see towers and spires of gleaming white. I would like to see our men on parade routes, not tours of duty. I would like to see every city in this planet, every colony in this besotted, miserable system turn to the service and industry of the Imperium in the Emperor's name. In the Emperor's name, sir. But to see my dreams fulfilled, first we must wipe the system clean of these blasted Xenos and heretics and monsters and... and zealots. And to do that, this base, our center of command, must operate free of danger or harassment. Our troops are ready. Our tanks and our sentinels. And if the Emperor wills it, we will have functioning Baneblades. Tell me, Commissar, are we prepared? Or will we be lambs taken to slaughter? Well, we'll do what we can and pray for victory. 
The enhanced basilisk cannon has been prepared by our tech priest engineers, has it not? It can be fired at will. Very good, General. It only requires an artillery spotter. We shall place our faith in the God Emperor. In the Emperor's name, sir. That will have to do the job. As always, we place faith in the Emperor. General, they approach. Hmm. Let them. When will we have our Bane Blades? Current munitions are arriving by convoy. It, uh, it will be several convoys before we have one operational, sir. So we just have to keep We're them busy until then. General, the mechanized command that the convoys were being dispatched from has been taken out. Well, sir, there are no more mechanized commands. There will be no more convoys. Golden Throne, protect us now. They've thrown a wrench in our Bane Blade production. We're just gonna have to do without them. If they think that's all we've got up our sleeves... Squad's got their morale Officer, back. we fight We're until the last. Attack. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Any soldier caught abandoning his post is to be shot the without boss. further questioning. Who we can still shot? win this. Well, for... All my work, crushed, crushed. All the good men who gave their lives for this cursed, this blasted system. Though my army lies in ruins today, I have not done fighting. And I will remember who my enemies are. One, its strength and momentum had reached truly great proportions. For a brief moment, the thick, tiered defenses and heavy munitions of the Imperial Guard's stronghold threatened to stall, or worse yet, break the Warlord's orcish avalanche. And although the pink skins put up a good fight and cost Gorgut's many an orc, finally they were stomped flat. This was the first victory the old Kaurava Orc clans had ever achieved on the city world of Kaurava I. The great victory provided a huge morale boost to the entire Orc army, and many Wa banners were spontaneously raised there, in Dusala and across all their Kauravan territories. But few Orcs were happier than the Mech Boys, who, in conquering the Imperial Guard's stronghold, laid claim to a vast array of tanks, guns, and other spoils to be modified for Orc use. Gorgut's mechs even managed to turn some of the Imperium's war factories to their use, promising readier and cheaper garrisons across Kaurava. It may never be known what first awakened the cold legions of the Necron from their vast burial vaults in the southern coast of Kaurava III. Archives suggest that Imperial Guard survey crews may have been dispatched to coastal Emosa several months before the conflict. 
Others point to the strange and unknown influence of the warp storm, which could somehow have roused the deathless Necrons from their slumber. Out of the dry Emosan sands, an ancient complex emerged. Part burial ground, part power plant, part staging ground. As builder scarabs removed sands and restored structures to power, its clean-cut symmetrical and lifeless form emerged. It pulsed with the green glow of the strange power which fuels the Necrons. Vast reserves of it. Enough to drive an endless stream of monoliths and Necron soldiers. Anyone foolish enough to assail this unearthed necropolis would do well to heed that flow of energy. It is the source of the Necron's power, and if unchecked, there is little limit to what strength Necrons could marshal against their foes. So, they come. Give you energy, drink of it, and awake. They shall meet their ends. They shall join the army of death. What's this? Them monoliths in the corners is plugged in. If we don't stomp them, they'll go full up. They'll be worse than all four squig are stomping on us. Unplug them, that's what I say.
war boss Gorguts was concerned, the Necrons were no more than a vast army of little mechs. True enough, some of the boys seemed a bit unnerved by the dark metal battalions that massed like a lake at the base of the exhumed necropolis on the Emosan coast. But Gorguts simply made sure that they were more frightened by him, and they fought good enough. Although he'd had his doubts, the victory over the Necrons was as good a proof as any, in Gorgut's eyes, that the Kalraven boys were worth their squigs. They had a tough time of it, descending into the bowl of death among the hot sands. But as Gorgut's figured these things, orcs were for fighting, and there was nothing better than a good hard fight so long as you won. Sure, that deceivy thing had come up, and turned his boys' heads this way and that, but they beat it good in the end. More than any other race, the Eldar concerned themselves with the distant past and the distant future. In visions, Farseer Keris anticipated the reawakening of their ancient foes, the Necrons and Kaurava III. A webway gate, unused for many millennia, flickered to life. In the blink of an eye, a barren tract of the wasteland planet became a sprawling base of operations, and the Eldar army poured forth from it. Just as quickly, this stronghold vanished from the naked eye, concealed by Eldar artifice. The Eldar had learned long ago that no bulwark, no matter how strong, could halt the slow, implacable progress of the Necrons. Only illusion, deceit, and misdirection could accomplish that goal. And these are things at which the Eldar are peerless. The Eldar had prepared a harrowing gauntlet for their invaders, with all the feints and deceptions they could muster. This stronghold was not just a foothold, not just a key strategic point, not just home to many Eldar secrets. No, through its long history, it had become sacred to the craft world Eldar, and they would defend it accordingly. They approach. We are prepared. Yes, Farseer, but... Yes? Must we fight? We shall fight. They must never suspect. They shall come, expecting the obvious, the simple, the artless. They shall stab at the shadows with confused minds and troubled hearts. Meanwhile, we shall appear unseen from ten directions, and from every one, Strike a fatal blow. Do you know the history of this place? which we call Esselir Talith, and the young races call the Upper Wastes. We, the Eldar, made our war camp here, in a past age. Yes, that is so. Our ancestors came here to fight the Necrons when they were an overwhelming wave that swept the worlds. This system was one of their stages of destruction, their foundries of undeath. Our ancestors defeated them here. We constructed our War Operations Center here as an illusion. No brute army, no simple display of force could uncover its secrets, and none ever shall. No, it is more than an illusion. It is a clever trap, this place our ancestors forged. It is a net covered in leaves that the savage beast willingly stands on, 
tempted by a bloody morsel, only to find itself hoisted, trapped, at the hunter's mercy. No, we shall guard our secret. No force can strike a target it cannot find. We shall not yield up our foothold on this world. Carava was once ours, and shall be ours again. Look here, you socket runts! Down there! That's the pointy ear big fall. We blast that! We blast them all off a of Carava! So get the blasters and shooters ready, cause we got some fighting to do! It's what we've got! Say so? They We're under attack! Spicy. Is it time? Um, Shoot! Smash the top! Stop! Now, quickly, to safety! Orcs is Listen up, boys! Fighting. We got a settlement some grunts, right? That means it's time for this here war! To get going! To get going! For fighting! How we better we go into a fight! Are. You have stepped into our snare! Do not expect to escape it alive! Oh, where'd I go? Come back and fight, you squigs! Nobs ready for battle! Weary of firing at shadows and illusions, we will always elude you. Leave now while you can. What? That's not the real base, neither! When I get over there, I's gonna. First, we gotta get all the boys there, huh? Duck, chew him up, and spit him out! We're under attack! We came here long, long ago. We did battle with our deathless foes, the Necrons, and won. This day, this day we have lost. If they swarm again like locusts here, some other must stop them. For we shall be gone. If Warboss Gorguts had learned anything in his many years leading the Orcs, it's that the Eldar, or Pointy Ears, were trouble and it was best to crush them as soon as you had the chance. When his caravan boys found themselves in the hot sandy barrens of the Upper Waste, he gave them a good talk, warning them that they'd have to be the sharpest-eyed, fastest, choppiest orcs ever known. While it might not be said that the orcs anticipated every move of the quick-witted and devious Eldar, they certainly proved that orcish strength and resilience could stand up to any such trickiness. Pressed hard by the avalanche of orcs, the Eldar fought frantically and then, overwhelmed, succumbed. The fact that some Eldar, including the Farseer Carries, were able to retreat to their last webway gate before the advancing orcs troubled Gorguts very little. He had won. The orcs scoured the area, uncovered the many caches and depots hidden within the stronghold's grounds, and smashed a great deal of it with triumphant enthusiasm.
Under the visionary leadership of Warboss Gorguts, the Orcs achieved a complete and unrivaled victory over all four planets of the Kaurava system. Generations of Kauravan Orcs had dreamed of such a day, never imagining that they would not only overthrow the Imperial Guard, but seven other armies to achieve their aim. All Kaurava was soon overrun and teeming with orcs. A phase of wild looting and pillaging was followed by orc settlement, wherein clans laid claim to entire territories at a time. Without the watchful eye of Gorguts, however, all this would have ended in confusion and petty clan warfare. Gorgas had other greater plans. The four planets of Karava were to be turned to this purpose. Mines yielded valuable metals, and fields of orcish factories produced everything required for a proper campaign of galactic conquest. A great war, staged from such an excellent platform and supplied with such resilient, war-worthy orcs, how could such a war result in anything but great victories and greater glory? They hailed the mighty leader, Warboss Korguts, Lord Aal Korluvar.